third icon I wrote about was homology in vertebrate limbs. If you look at the bone structure of the human hand or the human arm, you compare that to a whale's flipper or a bird's wing or a bat's wing, there are certain striking similarities in the bone structure. And Darwin considered this uh, to be a result of common descent. But people before Darwin had noticed the same thing, and they called it, uh, they attributed it to a common designer. Well, the truth is, it could be either one. The bone structure itself doesn't tell us. The controversy in modern times is not between science and religion, it's between two different interpretations of the same scientific evidence. It's not science versus religion, it's science versus science. There's no controversy among scientists over whether evolution took place. I don't know anybody who argues against whether evolution took place, except for those who have religious reasons for it. Anytime anyone criticizes Darwin's theory of evolution, evolutionists immediately cry, it's about religion. Well, the claim that all skeptics about Darwinian uh, orthodoxy or Christian fundamentalist stands refuted by me, it's obviously not true. I'm not, neither Christian nor a fundamentalist. Um, but lots and lots of people are skeptical in the scientific community. I became skeptical of Darwinian evolution early on, outside of any religious influence, just because of the complexity that I was learning about in the cell, and we use the word elegant in um, genetics. So I removed myself. In part, evolution was a powerful explanatory mechanism, but it seemed insufficient. In 1969, Kenyon co-authored the book Biochemical Predestination. In it, he presented an intriguing naturalistic explanation for the origin of complex protein molecules, the primary components of living cells. Kenyon wrote, life might have been biochemically predestined by the properties of attraction that exist between its chemical parts, particularly between amino acids in proteins. At the time that biochemical predestination came out, I and my uh, co-author were totally convinced that we had the scientific explanation for origins. Kenyon proposed that the chemical properties of the amino acids caused them to be attracted to each other, forming the long chains that became the first proteins, the most important components in the living cell. And this meant that life was effectively inevitable, predestined by nothing more than chemistry. Many scientists embraced Kenyon's ideas, and over the next 20 years, biochemical predestination became a best-selling text on the theory of chemical evolution. Yet five years after the book's publication, Kenyon quietly began to doubt the plausibility of his own theory. It was during that whole period of time that my doubts about certain aspects of the evolutionary account became apparent. When coming into contact with a powerful counter-argument given to me by one of my students, and I could not refute that counter-argument, Kenyon was challenged to explain how the first proteins could have been assembled without the help of genetic instructions. In living cells today, chains of amino acids are not formed directly by forces of attraction between their parts, the scenario Kenyon envisioned on the early Earth. Instead, another large molecule within the cell stores instructions for sequencing the amino acids in proteins. It is called DNA. Initially, Kenyon believed that proteins could have formed directly from amino acids without any DNA assembly instructions. And, and that's why so many scientists were excited about his theory. But the more he and others learned about the properties of amino acids and proteins, the more he began to doubt that proteins could self-assemble without DNA. In DNA, Kenyon encountered a molecule with a property he could not explain through natural processes. For locked securely within its double helix structure is a wealth of information in the form of precisely sequenced chemicals that scientists represent with the letters A, C, T, and G, or adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. In a written language, information is communicated by a precise arrangement of letters. In the same way, the instructions necessary to assemble amino acids into proteins 
are conveyed by the sequences of chemicals arranged along the spine of the DNA. This chemical code has been called the language of life, and it is the most densely packed and elaborately detailed assembly of information in the known universe. Like other scientists working on the origin of life, Kenyon realized he had two choices. Either he had to explain where these genetic assembly instructions came from, or he had to explain how proteins could have arisen directly from amino acids without DNA in the primordial oceans. And in the end, he realized he could do neither. It's an enormous problem how you could get together in one tiny submicroscopic volume of the primitive ocean all of the uh, hundreds of different molecular components you would need in order for a self-replicating cycle to be established. And so my doubts about whether amino acids could order themselves into uh, meaningful biological sequences on their own without pre-existing genetic material being present just reached, uh, I guess for me, the intellectual breaking point uh, sometime near the, the end of the decade of the 70s. As Kenyon reevaluated his theory, new biochemical discoveries further weakened his conviction that amino acids could have organized themselves into proteins. The more I conducted my own studies, including a period of time at NASA Ames Research uh, Center, uh, the more it became apparent that there were multiple difficulties with uh, the chemical evolution account. And uh, further uh, experimental work showed that amino acids do not have the ability to order themselves uh, into any biologically meaningful sequences. Faced with mounting difficulties in his own theory, and a growing body of scientific data about the importance of DNA, Kenyon was forced to confront the absolute necessity of genetic information. The more I thought about the enormous problem that all of us who worked on this field had neglected to address, the problem of the origin of genetic information itself, then I really had to reassess my whole uh, position regarding, uh, regarding origins. For Dean Kenyon, a new question became the focus of his search for life's origin. What was the source of the biological information in DNA? If one could get at the origin of the uh, messages, the encoded messages within the living machinery, then you would really be on to something far more intellectually satisfying than this chemical evolution theory. Mm -hmm. 